Oh, they're so nice about telling us that. <laughs> All right, so good morning. I'm gonna dive right in. Um, this is, as I said, the FY25 Arts and Humanities Fellowship Program Workshop. Um, just some housekeeping at the start. Uh, we like to start our commission meetings and events with our land acknowledgement to recognize the Nacotchtank and Piscataway people, the first residents of the land that would become the District of Columbia. And every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We stand on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank and the Piscataway people. We pay respect to their elders past and present. And please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events and to use such truths to guide the legacy of this Arts Commission. And we are the Arts Commission. This is the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. We're established in 1968. We are an independent agency. Um, I see people hopping in still. Um, and our, our position is that we are designated as the state's arts agency for the District of Columbia. We are supported by DC taxpayer funding and in part by the National Endowment of Humanities. And we help support the arts and humanities in DC. That is our job. Um, so just a couple of additional notes as we get started here. Um, Google Translate is available on our DC Arts website. It is an embedded program. So if you need language access, you can have it translated that way. Um, if there are any tools or structures to help you navigate our materials or portals, or you have any accommodations, our ADA coordinator is Travis Marcus. He is a wonderful person. He would be happy to help. Um, and we would ask that if you do need a reasonable accommodation request to contact us until one week before the application due date, which you will find out in another slide shortly. Um, and it'll be good. Um, so just a note for those who have just joined us, uh, just an FYI, we are recording this session. Um, and so, you know, if you want to keep things um, if you feel like muting yourselves or putting your cameras off, that's totally fine. Um, as we go through this, I will have pauses for Q and A. Uh, so it'll be great. We'll have some time where we can do that. We also have a chat box system in here. I'm monitoring that. I'll keep an eye on it throughout the, uh, this time, um, as best I can. Um, it is just me though. <laughs> All right. So uh, as we get started here, uh, just one more thing. Uh, we are also recruiting grant reviewers while our applications are open. Uh, our panelists are pretty integral to the grant making process. They provide our comments, our scores, and help us guide making our awards. Um, if you are interested, we'd love to speak to you about that. If you have friends who are interested, we'd love to speak to them. Um, it is also a paid position. Okay. So, um, this is the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the basics. We'll go over the staff and the cohorts, uh, eligibility and deadlines, required questions, narrative, application, uploads, navigating the portal, and required documents. There will be Q&As throughout. Um, and like I said, you can drop questions in the chat. So what is this? This is the Arts and Humanities Fellowship Program. And this is an annual fellowship that we give out as a grant to artists to continue to support their continued arts and humanities work. Who is it for? DC residents above the age of 18. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, offer this fellowship to residents of Maryland and Virginia. I will happily put you in contact with the grant managers for their fellowship programs. Um, they do good work too. How much is this award for? The awards are a flat amount for all awardees. We always endeavor to award as many grantees as we can and support as many artists as we can. For reference, the award for last year, FY24, was $5,500. Um, and what projects does this award cover? There is no project. Um, this is an open funding grant for grantees. You may use it however you need to support your work. You do not have to pitch a project to us. Um, I'm always interested in what you do with the money, but I don't 
absolutely need to know how you're spending it. So if you want to use it for a training program because there's a workshop you've always wanted to take, great. That sounds wonderful. I'm glad you're able to do it. If you need to buy equipment uh, for a project you're working on, again, phenomenal, great. Can't wait to see the results. If you just need to pay rent, also fine, also great. Um, all of that is okay. So um, here is the grants management staff. I don't think I ever bothered to introduce myself. I am Carrie Kaliba. I am the grant manager. <laughs> Probably should have done that earlier. Uh, but I am one of the grant managers here for this fellowship program. Um, I am available to help you in any way I can. I am specifically attached to the visual arts, theater, and design cohorts. And we'll talk about the cohorts next. Um, but if you do need help with anything, you can reach out to me. Um, and if I am not the right person, I will put you in contact with the correct person. Um, so I'm going to leave this slide up while I keep vamping through this in case you want to write this down, take pictures, take screenshots, anything like that. All of this information is also in our RFA, our request for applications. But like I said, if you reach out to me, I will happily connect you with the correct grant manager, or maybe a couple of us could be the correct grant manager. Um, so I am the contact for visual arts, theater, and design. My colleague Robert Nunez will, uh, is working with the musicians and go-go artists. Marcia Howard works with our dancers. Andrea Brown works with our teaching artists. Kayla Williams works with our humanities folk. And Terrell Johnson is working with interdisciplinary and media. Okay, great. Okay, so, um, so eligibility. Our eligible applicants need to be artists, arts professionals, and or humanities practitioners at least 18 years of age. We do need you to be legal adults. We would like you to be a District of Columbia resident for at least one year prior to the submission deadline and to have a permanent District of Columbia address as listed on government issued identification or tax returns. We cannot accept a PO box as a permanent address. If you are experiencing homeless or housing insecurity, please reach out to us um, and we can talk about it and talk about eligibility. Uh, we do ask that if you are awarded that you maintain DC residency throughout the granting period. Our fiscal year runs from October 1 to September 30 of the following year. Um, be in good standing with us. Uh, if you are a first time applicant, you are in good standing with us. If you are a returning applicant, um, good standing means that you are up to date with reports and any other compliance work that we have asked of you. Um, we try to keep those stakes low. If you have questions about any of that, do reach out to a grant manager. We'll confirm for you. And then also please be current on all taxes and liabilities owed to the district. This is part of our clean hands requirement. I'm gonna talk more about this when we get to the compliance documents at the end. So I don't want anyone to stress out too much about this. Okay. So in summary for eligibility, the eligible individuals may submit one grant application uh, as accessible from our website. So it's one application for the fellowship. Um, I I work with the visual artists. I know that uh, some of you may have applied to our art bank program that recently closed. Applying to art bank does not mean that you cannot apply to fellowship. It's just one application per program. Um, and some of you may have applied to our projects, events, or festivals for individual grants that closed a little while ago. Again, just one application per program. You're not excluded from applying to the fellowship as well. Um, applicants must submit those applications by 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, July 16th, 2024. We've got about a month, a month from tomorrow uh, to get those in. Staff will be on call and available until that 10 p.m. deadline. And then at 10.01, I will turn my phone off and go to sleep. Uh, but we are available, we'll be online, we'll be able to help out with technical difficulties and things like that. All of our applications are submitted online for through our grants portal. All right, brief pause for questions. I didn't see anything come through in the chat, but I wanted to give a little bit of space in case there's one. 
Um, oh, here's a good question. If one has previously been a recipient of the grant, does that lessen one's chances to be selected again? Should that be a be a disincentive to apply? Uh, no, no to both. Uh, being a prior awardee does not lessen your chances. Um, and it should not be a disincentive to apply. Um, we we treat every cycle as a new cycle. We try to put you as best we can in front of new eyes. Um, we sometimes do have panelists who return for uh, a year or two in a row. And I always, I at least try to make sure that uh, they're not seeing repeat applicants um, because that might cloud their judgment and they should see new art and it would be exciting. Uh, it does not lessen your chances. Um, and, and you should not treat that as a disincentive for application. The real disincentive to apply is if you live in Maryland or Virginia. We usually don't get Delaware, so it's fine. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So I'm gonna dive into the application materials. On our website, we do have our uh, request for application and our questions and uploads. The questions and uploads match the questions in the application. So if you want to read through it, it does have the prompts. So a little bit of explanation of what we're asking for for each thing. Um, so it's a good reference guide to have. You can download it. Maybe you want to fill it out and, and use that as a reference as you go through. I do ask with our RFA, it, it does have a long uh, pieces to it. It's got a lot of important legal information in there that's just our compliance information and things like that. But it does have a lot of other reference materials. Um, please read through it and then read through it again. Um, it's a fast read, I promise, especially the second time through. Um, but a lot of good information is in there. It's going to be really useful for you. It has all of our um, guidance of what we're asking for. We do also have our guide to grants on our website, which has additional information. Um, all of these resources should be readily available. And if you can't find them, let me know. I will drop you the link. Um, so on the application, we're going to ask for a couple of things. We're going to ask for your information. So your name, your address, the good basics. Um, a couple of narrative questions. We have three short answer questions. Some work samples. Uh, your work samples are going to depend on the cohort and the artistic discipline that you are a part of. Roughly speaking, if you are a visuals person, uh, we're asking for 10 images. If it's uh, the kind of thing where you've got audio or visual recordings, roughly two five minute audio visual recordings, or uh, if you're a writer, about 10 pages. Our guide to grants does have um, a longer list of, of guidance. And so that's uh, a good reference point to do to go back to and just double check. If you do have questions about how many work samples, ask us. Happy to help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then finally, uh, required documents. These are our compliance documents that we need for eligibility and processing. So, uh, so those disciplines and cohorts that I've talked about, um, and I said we all have these 10 cohorts. Um, these are our disciplines. We have identified these for purposes of panel organization. We ask that you select one of the categories that best represents your work and how you wish to be reviewed. Like, who do you want viewing your work? Um, and so these categories are dance, design, go-go, humanities, interdisciplinary, media, music, teaching artists, theater, and visual arts. Um, a note on interdisciplinary, it is, uh, we define that as uh, art where you have two or more disciplines where it's really intertwined. Um, so some examples that I've used in the past are if you are an author illustrator, you you produce poetry chat books where your illustrations are as much a part of the product as the words you write, you may consider yourself more of an interdisciplinary artist than a poet or a visual artist, um, or if it's hard to extract your work from itself. <clears throat> Lots of talking. Um, great question. Would film be considered media arts or visual arts? Media arts. We tend to uh, shuffle our film folk into media arts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So much talking already this morning. Um, and so a lot of times for documentary and short film folk, we find you in media arts and we tend to find documentarians and film folk to help review your work. This is really how we're uh, 
we want to put your work in front of the people who best understand your work. Um, I come from a theater background. I have a lot of appreciation for things, um, but truly I don't know enough about dance to be useful in a panel room. I like it. I like it a lot. I danced for a couple of years, but I do not know enough. Um, and so that's why we, we have these cohorts um, and how we organize them. If you were uncertain about your discipline, <clears throat> our guidance is look at your artist statement, look at your work samples and support materials that you would plan to upload. And then from there, choose the category that best reflects the statement, the samples, and your support materials. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second here. Really had to clear my throat. Um, if you are really unsure, contact a grant manager. That is what we are here for. So that list of folks at the beginning, or again, come to me. Um, I will, uh, I'm gonna have a pause in a little while uh, to have some more questions. Um, but in general, um, if you do have questions about where to go, it, it's always good to reach out to us. We'll have a conversation. We're happy to do that. Okay, Ooh, I went way too far there. <laughs> Okay, um, so required responses in the online application, a couple of things we're going to ask for. Your name. For this part, we need your name to be as it appears on your official tax documents or W-9, your legal government name. Um, the next couple of questions, have you applied for a grant from CAH in the past five years? Um, have you applied for and have you received? Mostly that's informational. Uh, it does not really impact uh, your scoring or review. And then has your address changed in the past 12 months or are you planning to move in the next 12 months? We're not tracking you. We just want to know. It It's a thing on the back end where we just want to make things easier if you are awarded so that we can get you paid in time. Um, if you your address has changed, does need to be updated in the grants portal. Again, we're not tracking you. I'm not going to come to your house. Um, I just it will make my life a tiny bit easier on the back end. <laughs> okay. Um, the narrative section, uh, we have these are those three short answer questions. We do recommend you compose your answers in another program and then cut and paste the text. The portal is not going to maintain formatting. So if you have strong feelings about font, um, this is not gonna be the time to have those feelings. Um, it, it just won't allow you to. Um, but we will have these three statements, the artist statement, the work statement, and the community statement. Broadly speaking, for the artist statement, we are asking you why you do what you do. What is the passion that drives you? Your work statement is what it is that you do. Maybe some guidance for the panelists on how to read or view your work. Um, some clarification about the process or the materials you use or, or what it is we're going to be watching or listening to. And then the community statement is why here? What makes you a DC artist? Well, I'm gonna dive a little bit more into these. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so this why you do what you do. This is um, trying to get us a, a picture of who are you as an applicant? Who are you as an artist? How did you come to this? What's your passion? Um, as part of the uh, scoring guidelines, which are in the RFA, what we're really looking for is finding a, a personal voice in your art artistic vision. Your statement plus your samples should give us an idea of who you are and, and why you're doing this and, and what's going on uh, to make you as make you as an artist. Um, your work statement, it's there to uh, clarify and enhance your work samples. It's not there to replace anything, but it gives us a chance for it gives you a chance to talk about your work. Um, maybe it's, hey, these should be listened to in this order so you can hear how the story builds. Um, you can see these images, how I've been playing with shape and space, anything like that. Um, and then we're also, and then finally, the community statement is why here? What makes you a DC artist? And part of this is you know, what is your artistic community? It does not have to be the whole city. Maybe you're part of a, a writer's group in Northeast and you just, that is your community and you've got a really solid group. Um, maybe you are 
booked and busy outside of the city. What makes you a, a DC artist if you are in Sacramento doing something? Uh, you got booked to do a mural series or you're on tour. You're still a DC artist even if you're not here. What makes you a DC artist? What makes you that ambassador for DC when you're gone? And what makes you a D why did you choose DC? Um, if you were not born here, why do you why did you come here and and work here? And if you d were born here, what makes you uh, stay here? All sorts of things. It's a very open-ended question. But it builds on that image of why what makes you an artist? <clears throat> um, there was a question here. Are these 300 word max or min? We do ask that it be, our guidance is going to be 300 max. Um, just a note, the portal will not shut down. It will not cut you off when you hit 300 words. It doesn't have that kind of character tracking. Um, this is just a, a minor note is um, think about how much impact you can make. All right, I'm going to keep. OK, we're at the q and I'm going to go through some of these questions that came through in the chat here since the last time. Um, would film be considered media or visual arts media? Um, if I'm a multidisciplinary artist, should I pick one to share work samples from or share some from both? That's largely going to be dependent on what kinds of work samples you want to share and where you feel strongest. Um, a lot of times we are on a journey uh, in our artistic practice. We may have started one place and ended up in another place. I mentioned earlier, I have a theater background and now I spend all of my time uh, in visual arts and craft spaces. So my world has changed. I still think of myself as a theater kid, but most of my energy is spent in crafting spaces. Um, so I have to sometimes think about that and what sort of work samples I would come through. Um, if you do have, if you are a multidisciplinary artist, um, I do recommend you come talk to us. Um, think about your work samples, think about where you'd be strongest in, uh, but you can always talk to us. You can send us a message, we'll set up a meeting. Um, for teaching artist samples, we're looking, um, I am not the teaching artist uh, folk, uh, you'd want to touch base with Andrea Brown, but what we'd look for there a lot of times is things like syllabi, um, evidence of your teaching work, uh, your teaching philosophy, and things like that. Um, 300 words max or min. Uh, like I said, aim for 300 word max. Um, I also like to recommend uh, as you are developing your applications, it would be great to have someone else read it. Um, we sometimes get it stuck in our silos and it is difficult to, to see how our work uh, relates to the outside. Um, it is great to have somebody else read over things and, and ask you questions. Um, we are somewhat available for that, but it's also good to have people in your own lives do that. Um, also really valuable in terms of, uh, have you gone on too long or do you need to expand? Um, and if a video for a photographer and videographer curious about the work samples requirement, um, we are going to get into some of the work sample requirements, but just a preview, our, we ask that work samples be no more than three years old. Um, if you have something that is part of a series, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, and then Alan uh, asked uh, about, oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Alan, um, do you want to come off mute and just real quick, what is your question about discipline and work samples? Alan? Um, in general for work sample. Oh, okay, great. All right. I'm going to keep rolling. Um, oh, and there was a question. Does the application ever change year to year? Um, largely the application is very similar to where it was last year, but it is different from where it was the year before that. 
Um, we do change the application and review it every year. It is an iterative process. So we do not maintain it. Uh, we do not let it stay stagnant. We are trying to be responsive to the feedback we receive from panelists and from applicants. Okay. I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> okay. Application uploads. Um, these are going to be parts of your application. We're going to look for your artistic resume, your work samples, and support materials. Okay. So for your resume, uh, what we're looking for is your resume of your artistic and humanities work. The style of this, we don't ask for a consistent style. Uh, we don't have a standardized rubric for you or, or model. It's whatever is appropriate for your area of work or what you have handy. Um, your artist CV, what we're looking for is your record of your professional, professional experience and artistic achievements. If you don't have one, totally fine. You can have a list of, of projects and events that you've completed within the last three years. Headshots, we're used to them. Lists, artists, CVs, totally fine. You know, the the 30 or the the hundred word bio that you've submitted for the program, we've we've seen it all. Um and and we don't none of them really get penalized. We're just looking for a a, a list of your your experience and your work. All right. So your work samples, um, the requirements and limits are going to depend on your artistic or humanities discipline. If you have questions about how your practice is going to fit into a cohort or what samples to use, please reach out to a grant manager. And once again, we do ask that work samples be within the last three years. Um, I have spoken with some people where it's, um, uh, you know, they've been they've been working on a, a photo series for the last 10 years and it's still in process. And and there we can talk about, okay, well, maybe the stuff from 10 years ago is informing the stuff from this year. We can talk about how those samples would work together because it's an ongoing project. Or, you know, same thing. I've been working on this novel for five years and we can see the growth. Let's let's talk about how those work samples might work and how we contextualize them. Um, but we do ask that they be recent work samples, recent in the last three years. Um, so a couple of things, your image files, we're going to ask that they be JPEGs or PNGs. Um, just a fun fact, when you take a photo on your iPhone, it saves it as a .heic file, which we can't accept. Um, the portal just does not display it. It's really annoying. Um, so if you are going to take photos on your iPhone, um, please convert them. Um, if you need help with that or need some guidance on how to get to that, let me know. Uh, I, I have been working with this for a couple of years. I've, I have seen many a .heic file. I have written many strongly worded complaints to Apple on the matter. I don't think they care about my feelings. Um, mm -hmm. Audio files, we have MP3. Uh, if you just a note on our audio player, the one that we have in the portal does not allow for for scrubbing or tracking. So if you do have something where you want, uh, let's say you have a, a 25 minute audio file uh, because you you have written yourself, uh, you have written your symphony and you want panelists to listen to the middle five minutes, they won't be able to do that in our audio player. Um, more than happy to help you with options of maybe uploading it into YouTube uh, with the old, you know, screen savory thing background. Love that. Very soothing to watch. Um, but that does allow for a little bit more control in terms of, of shifting to a specific spot. Come talk to us. We have we have handled almost all of the issues and questions over the years. Very happy to help you with that. Um, for document files across the board, we do ask for PDF. It is the safest and most stable way to get these documents. Um, it's easier for everyone to open. We do ask not for Microsoft Word. Otherwise, you know, we're asking people to download things. I am on a Windows-based system in the office. Many of our panelists and other folks are on a Mac-based system, and those programs don't always like to talk to each other. Um, PDF, at least, is stable across systems, so we do ask for PDF. Um, and then video files, I'm going to go into a little bit of how the uploading works. Uh, we can take an MP4 file. 
We can also take a YouTube link and a Vimeo link. Uh, for a lot of these, you may want to have, you may have password protection on them for your own reasons. Um, just make sure you save those passwords for our panelists so they can view them. I'm going to. And then this is just a reminder, if you want panelists to review your work, it must be uploaded in the application. Please do not submit a list of links for us. Please don't have a work statement and then say at the end of it, and go see my website for more. Here's my SoundCloud. Check out my playlist. Here's my Instagram. We do not ask panelists to follow those links. We really want it to stay within the four corners of the application. If you are having any difficulty, concerns about converting or, or getting your work samples into a format that is uploadable, this is what we're here for. Um, again, I'm happy to talk to you about the big picture stuff about your work statements and artist statements and the nitty gritty of how am I going to upload this. Okay. Um, so support materials. This is a third part. These are uh, the types of documents you might want to have for support materials and the quantity, the number of those is going to, again, reflect on your practice. It's going to be very individualized. The support materials should strengthen your application and provide additional information. They should not replace a work sample. And you don't really want to overwhelm people with work with support materials. We're really focusing on, on the work that you're doing and your statements. But some samples of support materials you might have and might want to upload um, contracts for work that you had in the past three years or have coming up. And I still didn't fix that date, did I? Um, but things that may be coming up, you're, you're booked and busy for the next year. Super. That's great. Good for you. Um, maybe programs or playbills, reviews of your work. Uh, you were part of a gallery show and city paper and the Washington post reviewed it. Super incredible. Uh, letters from parents or students, um, surveys, evaluations. Uh, you were part of a, a touring company and you got mentioned uh you got a shout out in a local bloggers review again great um i'll be honest i haven't figured out what to do with the these tiktok and instagram reviewers but i'm happy to talk to you about them if that's if you have those <laughs> um, it's a brave new world we're in every day um you know interviews book reviews anything like that um they're all going to be very specific for the work that you do we don't suggest or or think that you should, you know, solicit them if it's going to be an extra burden on you. Um, if you you letters of recommendation are not always applicable for for what you're doing, and it's fine. Everybody's support materials are going to be different. Um, we do have some some broad guidance. We do want you to keep your support materials to three, roughly three categories. Um, so let's say you have, uh letters of recommendation, you've got some letters of support, um, but you also have some reviews, that would be two categories, letters of support and reviews. Um, if you have a couple of reviews, you did a, a show and it got reviewed in a few places, compile them into one PDF document for, for ease of reading. Uh, and I'll just make things easier. It will be, uh, you know, viewable and more understandable that way. Any questions? This is the time, Alan. I see that you are off mute, but I just can't hear you. Is that my fault? Any other questions? Great question. Can you work on the application episodically, adding to it, or must it be completed all at once? You can save as you go. You can you can start it today and not finish it until 9.59 on July 16th. I am begging you to not finish it at 9.59 on July 16th. 
earlier would be better, but that's great. Um, no, you can work on it in pieces, you know, get all of your basic information in today. Okay. Yeah. Feel free, Alan. Just, you know, I'm going to drop my email in the chat as well, just to make sure you have it again. Um, but we can absolutely talk. Um, and then, yeah, uh, like I said, you can work on this in pieces. Think about it. We've got a month. Uh, it'll be great. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit here about the grants portal. If you are a returning applicant, a lot of this is going to be familiar. And just a reminder, if you're new, welcome to the portal. Um, we do recommend using Google Chrome. It seems to work the best and the smoothest applicant experience. Um, it will work on other browsers. Chrome just seems to work the best. So on our website to get to our portal, our website is dcarts.dc.gov. You're going to go to programs and you'll find grants from the drop down menu. You can see all of our beautiful images. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Last minute is terrible. I'm there. I'm there to help, but please don't at the last minute. Um, but you'll find grants. Grants is going to take you to a page which has all of our information. It has all of our current open funding opportunities. We have a couple of grants open right now. They'll all be listed there, including the links to our live chats and workshops. Um, I'll talk more about those at the end. You'll also find links for our guide to grants, the RFAs, fillable PDFs of the required documents, more information on workshops, and the link to the grants portal. When you click on that, it's going to take you to an external page to our portal. Uh, you will hear us, the grant managers, refer to this as both the portal and jungle lasers. That's the supplier, so uh, and it's more fun to say jungle laser than portal. Um, but when you get here, you'll find yourself on our landing page. If you are brand new, sign up today, big green button, if you're returning, log in uh, with that returning link. The name and address that you use in the grants portal should match the address and name that you're going to use on all of your other documentation, like your W-9. It's a great time to update it if you're returning. Okay. So just a reminder, your applicant profile is going to be your government name. If you are working under a different name, if you have a doing business as, if you have an artist name, if there is your preferred name, that's going to be your request name. Um, that is going to be the name that we would put out publicly. You know, when we announce the awards, that's the name we'd want to be using. But for the back end kind of nitty gritty boring stuff, um, like paying you out if you are awarded, we are going to need your government name. Okay. Work samples. So once you get through that part and we're here, we're ready to do our applications. You've got a new application here if you're starting a new one in the top right. Over on the left, there's a section for open applications and submitted applications. If you have already submitted an application this year or in prior years, so maybe you applied for our PEF grant earlier this year or Art Bank or you're a returning fellow, your submitted application materials will still be there and they'll be in that submitted application section. Your open applications and your open requests down at the bottom will be your current applications. So this is that place where you can start it, leave it in draft, come back to it later. Up until the moment you hit submit, it's okay. All right, so once you're ready, you'll hit new application. Um, you'll go through all of that informational stuff. It's going to bring you to a couple of places here. This is where we're going to talk about adding your work samples. This is a little bit more complicated, so it's a part we like to focus on in these workshops. Um, so here's the statement where you're going to describe how the content of your work samples uh, works with your, uh, your statement. And then we have this media viewer. Generally speaking, for my humanities folks and writers, you're going to be putting your work samples down in our documents section. But for those folks who've got media like images or video or music, it's going to end up in this media viewer section. There's a two part process to adding your samples here. The first one is you're going to go to your media library and add, add your items there, and then you will attach them here. So step one is the library. Step two is the attach from library. Under 
Just as a note, underneath the media library is a document library. If you want to just add documents there so that they're stable and ready for you when you need them, that's a great place to add them. Um, if you're a returning applicant, you know, this is a great place to just drop in a new W-9. Uh, if you've got things you just need to add, put that in your documents library so you know that they're there. All right, so onward. All right, so this media viewer, after you have attached your media files, you've dropped your links, you've uploaded an MP4, whatever it is, you've added your JPEGs, they should show up here in your media viewer. And they, excuse me, they should be viewable. So here is a Vimeo link that got dropped in. And I can see that there's material here, so I'm pretty sure it's going to play. Usually, if it's just a plain black box, there's something may have gone wrong. Maybe the link got broken or something like that. Um, if that is the case, you know, just test it. Make sure it's playable. If it's still not playable, you can't figure out what's wrong. Let us know. We'll help you out. Um, you'll also see your images here um, and a lot of other, and this will be your your work samples. Good to check, just to make sure they're viewable and playable. Um, so like I said, you can link directly. We do have a description box. This is where we want to put the title of our works. If you have time codes or pass codes for something, you have a, you know, like I said, you have a 25 minute symphony, you have an hour long documentary. It's fine. Please don't go to any extra trouble or, or difficulties to edit something down. If it's stable and it's happy, just tell us where we should skip to. We're happy to do that. We're happy to guide the panelists to that. Um, if you do have, so maybe your description here is my video start at 4, 6, 62. No, there's only 60 seconds in a minute. Um, 4.23, um, 7.12, anything like that. Um, and then, you know, just make sure it's also not secret. There's those unlisted um, options in YouTube uh, to help make things a little more private. Uh, just make sure we can still view it and access it. That'd be great. Um, yeah. And then, uh, okay, so yeah, this is going to be, once they're added to the media library, they get attached to the application. It should open a pop-up window. I realize that all of our sample images here have Mozilla Firefox, like I didn't just say use Chrome. Um, just a little bus making fun there. Um, should open a pop-up window. If you're not getting a pop-up window, do check for a pop-up blocker. And then just a note, um, this affects my uh, visual folks a lot. Uh, images will not always view in the order that you attach them. They like to resort the order into alphabetical. So if it's really important for panelists to view works in a certain order, then I always recommend add a number to the front of the title um, because that'll that'll override the, the alphabetical thing. So just a one, two, three, four, five, um, at the start of your image so that it will resort into the order that you want it to be viewed. Um, if it doesn't matter to you much about what order they show up in, you know, disregard me. Titles are great. Um, and I did see, uh, get to this end here. Okay. Okay, I did get a question here um, about the support materials. When we upload our three support materials as a single PDF, uh, or should they be their own PDF? Um, I like them to be a single PDF if they're the same type of thing. So if it's reviews or um, uh, program listings or um, support letters, anything like that, I like them clumped into groups. So uh, you've got three letters of recommendation in, in one document. You have... Uh, for uh, reviews in one document. Uh, you have other things in one document, um, just so we have them in categories. Uh, but then again, as you're compiling them, uh, you may have a ton, you may have very little. Just think about how much you're, you're, if you're putting more effort into this than you're putting into your work samples and things. Okay. 
Any other questions about the, the portal or any questions about the portal at all? Okay. So then the last part of our application are the required forms. These are our compliance and eligibility documents. So a couple of things here, we're looking for your proof of residency. We are looking for either your, uh, your, driver's, your driver's license or ID card or some alternate proofs of residency. I like to think of this as what does the DMV ask you for? If you're thinking about how to do proof of residency, what would the DMV ask you for? Or what would um, voter registration ask you for? They've got nice long lists. Um, so that may be a, a lease or your uh, utilities. Um, feel free, by all means, to block out any uh, private information. We're, we're not here to, to do a full audit of your life. Uh, we just want some, some brief proof of residency. Um, your statement of certification, which is a DC gut document, uh, I, IRS form W-9, and a certificate of clean hands. So proof of residency, uh, like I said, alternate proofs may be a lease, maybe a utility bill. Um, please mark out any sensitive information. A passport is not proof of residency, but I am glad you have one. Um, the statement of certification, this is a district document that we ask for. Um, it is really just making sure we know who you are and who can talk to us about reporting and your award. Uh, you may have filled out one of these. Uh, you have definitely filled out one of these if you're a returning grantee, uh, but you may have filled one out this year already for PEF or Art Bank for some of you folk. Um, we just ask for that, make sure you have the correct grant program listed on it. I cannot accept Art Bank uh, statements of certification. I'm very happy that you're all doing that. I just can't accept that uh, statement of certification if you are awarded a fellowship with me. Um, again, the name and address needs to match. Um, it's a four page document. There's only things to fill out on the first page and the fourth page. But on the fourth page, we are asking for a signature on any of our uploaded documents where we're looking for a signature, we need to have either a wet ink signature, so, you know, printed, signed, scanned, or a verified digital signature. So something like Adobe or DocuSign with the, the date stamp certification. If you're having any difficulties with those or, or you're just, you're struggling with it, um, please let us know, we'll help. Excellent question on the statement of certification. Who should list here to authorize the us? Authorize yourself. Um, this is kind of a weird thing. It is a document that we require for all of our grant programs, but there is a difference between you and a very large institution. Uh, so for something like a, a museum or an art center, a lot of times we are working for staff. You are your own staff here. Um, so it's, you know, you are your own individual negotiating on behalf of yourself as an applicant. Um, we just need to have this for compliance. It is a district requirement, um, for all of our grants across the entire city. Um, so yeah, so yeah, you would put your name, um, mark out that you're an individual, your address, the grant program, which would be FY25 AHFP or FY25 fellowship. Both are acceptable you are negotiating on your own behalf, um, and then just sign it on the last page. It's it's a reference compliance document. We do have a copy of this form on our website, uh, so you can always fill it out. Okay. Uh, the W-9, we do need this. Um, they just changed it. That was a surprise for all of us. I didn't know they were gonna do that. Uh, but, but there is now a March 2024 version. We do need it to be the updated March 2024 version, not the October 2018, which if you are re returning to us, you may have. Um, so that is going to be up in the top left corner. Um, every year, I'm amazed that people still have the December 2020 version or December 2010 version, uh, which is Great, I'm glad we're preserving that. Um, but I do need the 2024 March version. Um, again, all of your documents with your government name, uh, correct boxes. Um, this is a good, uh, the address thing is just a thing that we need to, to keep track of on our end. It's not gonna impact your award. Um, this is us asking for things. 
for the fellowship and for all of our individual awards, we do need to have your social security number for the taxpayer ID. I know a lot of people have LLCs or EINs where they're they're working, they're putting their artwork under the LLC or under some other kind of uh, sole proprietorship business. But for this, it does need to be your individual award, not your business award. Um, so we are going to need to ask that this come through as an individual award social security number basis. Again, the signature must be an ink or a verified electronic signature, and we do need to have that saved as a PDF. We do have a fillable PDF available on our website. If you are having problems with getting it or you can't quite make the signature work, reach out. Happy to do it. Um, we can take a, an ink manual. We can also take an ink where it's you drew on with your finger. Technology is strange. Um, as long as we can tell that it was it was done by by hand manually and not just typed in. We just can't take a typed signature, um, no matter how fancy the font is. Uh, it it's got to be a, a some kind of a human intervention. Uh, we can take a verified electronic signature. If you're having problems getting that, again, reach out to us so that we can help set that up for you. Okay. Uh, and then finally, this is the Certificate of Clean Hands. I mentioned at the start of this that we want you up to date on uh, payments and liabilities. That is really more for if you are awarded and on the payout end. Um, so some things about the Certificate of Clean Hands. This is a, a document that just certifies that you do not owe uh, taxes or liabilities to the district. That may be anything from, like I said, your, your personal taxes to a parking ticket. Uh, you would apply for this on My Tax DC, the DC uh, Office of Tax and Revenue website. You would ask to, we ask you to download a PDF. But a couple of things to note here: if you will not be able to attain a certificate of clean hands by the deadline, you may still be able to apply for the grant. If you are asking for it and it comes back and it says you are non-compliant, again, you are able to apply for the grant. We just ask that you keep us in the loop. Um, just let us know that something's going on or you've been trying to get into the OTR website, but it's just something's not working. The information weird uh, systems are terrible. Totally fine. Please reach out to us and just let us know what's happening and then we can work with you. This is not something that goes to the panelists. Uh, it is something that we need for compliance and eligibility. But if you want to, but just keep us in the loop. So if if I hear from you on July 16th at 4 p.m. that you're struggling to get this clean hand, something's going wrong, just please let me know. We can work with you. We can help you get through this next stage and make this work. Um, I don't want anybody to get to this point and, and stop. Um, just, yeah, let us know. Um, so... On the website, there is a section for when you get to mytaxdc.gov, there's a section for clean hands. It's a smiling lady. She's at a shop. It says open. That's the clean hands section. When you click on that, see here, smiling lady, it says open. There are three options. There's the apply for a certificate, validate a certificate, and learn more. If you have never done this process before, you'll need to apply. If you have done this process before and you have a clean hands and it's maybe uploaded in a prior application, you can validate it and you don't have to go through the whole application process. That's the second option here where you validate a certificate of clean hands. You go to my tax, click on validate. You're going to follow some prompts. So on a prior notice, you would have this Notice number at the top, it starts with an L, and then it's got about 12 digits after it. You just put that in, and then the four digits of your social security number, and it will pop out with a brand new certificate of clean hands, and it's updated, and it makes your life easier. Um, save that as a PDF attached to your application. Um, if you do this process and it comes back and it says non-compliant, that's just a fun thing to say, oh, I should check in on that. Again, totally fine. Um, none of this should be a, a thing that stops you from applying. Um, 
we're big fans of this validation thing, by the way. We we think this is the best because uh, it makes things a lot easier to get updated certificates. We're wonks. <laughs> All right. Um, so just as we come to the end here, we're wrapping up, I promise. Uh, for best results, save and upload all grant materials as PDF. Please keep your name and address consistent. Any questions anywhere in the process, at any time, please contact a grant manager. That's what we're here to do. We are here to help. Uh, that's that's the, the game. Um, and then just a, a quick timeline. Um, after you submit your application, we, the staff, will review for eligibility and completeness. We sort everything into cohorts for panel review. We send it out to the panelists to review and score. And then we'll make funding recommendations based on their scores that go in front of our commissioners. Um, if you are awarded, you will know on or around October 1. October 1 is the start of our fiscal year. So that's when we're anticipating uh, announcing the awards. So it'll either be that day or right after it. It will not be before October 1, though. Um, if you are awarded, you will receive information. Um, we ask that you repeat, complete and return the forms. And then we've got this uh, payment system. We will help you navigate. All of this is future problems. Hopefully problems for future you. Um, and then if you are awarded, we do ask for a report at the end of the cycle. OK. I'm going to scroll right into the final notes, and then I'll have a, a section for questions. I'll stop the recording, and we can do a, kind of an open discussion. OK. Um, live chats. Throughout the open period, we do have more of these workshops. It will be more of the same information. But if you want to just come spend time with me, that's great. It would be great to see you again. Um, but we do have live chats every Friday from 2 to 3, with the exception of July 5th. Um, these are open-ended for all of our open grant programs. You can just come and listen. You can come and ask a question, whatever you want. It's a live chat with grants uh, team members. A couple of us will be on the call so we can all kind of talk through things with you. Um, if you have really specific questions, I do recommend reaching out to us, but you can also hang out on a live chat. It's a great opportunity. Um, we are also piloting office hours with our grant specialists. These are going to be on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Uh, there will be members of the grants team there to do uh, grant applications, but also other issues you may be having with our systems. Uh, you'll have a couple of us there. Um, we'll have more information on that available. Those will be ongoing through September, so even after the application closes, and then we'll probably do another round of them after September, have a new date, new schedule for you. But this is going to be our summer office hours availability if you just want to drop in and ask a quick question. Um, and then we are available uh, for, you know, send us an email. I prefer email. It's just a little bit easier for me to track things. Um, but you can call me. You can text me. Um, but, you know, sometimes email is a little easier for me. <laughs> and that's it. That is our, our entire workshop. Um, our office hours, just so you know, are 9 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. on Monday through Friday. We do have an office. Several of us are still working uh, remotely a few days a week, so we're not always in the office building, but we are available. Um, and you can find us. So I am going to stop that presentation. I'm going to stop that sharing. Um, and I'm also going to stop the recording here.